wide awake now. If you're out there, come on back here. Thank you all for staying here. I've arranged for some rain so you'll all stick around. Um, so I really appreciate you all uh, taking the time to be here with me. I'll try to keep this entertaining. If you didn't bring a beer, you should have brought one. Um, so I'm here to talk to you about the future of the future. Um, and I'm kind of sick of people talking about the word disruption. Uh, I think disruption is a massively overused term. Uh, that word, I don't think it means what you think it means, and it gets used a hell of a lot. Uh, so I want to talk a little bit about what disruption actually means. So we all know what innovations are. And innovation is when you just make something a little better, right? Like you add a new feature, something good, that's great. And innovation is the nature of all sustainable products. Disruption, somebody is going to get killed. Like, when you disrupt an industry, the disruption means something's getting destroyed. If you can't tell me what you destroy with your product or service, it's not disruptive. But what I find fascinating is discontinuities. Because a discontinuity is when you can no longer understand the world as it was beforehand. So, yeah, it's great if you're innovating, but you know what? You're just doing your job. Um, someone's going to get hurt if you disrupt something, but the world has fundamentally changed when we go through this kind of discontinuity. This is like the uh, appetite for destruction in the middle. That's great. But what you really care about is those discontinuities. i me give you a concrete example of that. Uh, if you think about Mercedes-Benz, Mercedes-Benz, you know, if you build a new uh, electric car, that's great. It's innovation. You've built a new product. It's kind of cool. But you're still selling cars to drivers through dealerships. You haven't really undermined the business model that much. But when you deliver a service like Car2Go, which is owned by Mercedes-Benz. Mercedes-Benz owns Car2Go. Every time someone chooses to use Car2Go, instead of buying a car, that disrupts the car industry. You've got a different market. People don't want to own cars, but they want to drive. You've got a different product, cars by the hour, and it's a different channel. It's sold through uh, an automated app on a month-by-month, -month, uh, on a mile-by-mile -mile basis, or a time basis, rather than through a dealership. <clears throat> but when you get to something like a self-driving car, <clears throat> that's when the world really blows up. Because in this case, once we all have automated um, movement and automated transportation, the world will not be easy to understand. Like, it will be hard to understand what the world was like when you had to drive yourself places, if that happens. To me, the future of technology itself isn't that interesting. When someone says, you know, what do you think the future of VR is, I don't really care. What's interesting is what the future of humans is. Discontinuities are interesting. So discontinuity, let me first explain what that means. A discontinuity is, is a change so significant we can no longer imagine the world before it. Foucault said that a discontinuity is a time when things are no longer perceived the same way. Like you can't look back in time and understand the world. And similarly, it's very hard to look forward in time and understand the world. Um, and discontinuities get triggered all the time. They sneak up on us, they take a bunch of tech, but they get triggered all the time. A good example of this is agriculture. So if these look abstract, let me give you a concrete example of agriculture. Farming came from some components. It came from the, the creation of the calendar, it came from an understanding of germination and weather systems and irrigation and the plow and so on. But it had these incredible consequences because once we had abundant food, we had a surplus of time which we could then devote to uh, education and to uh, and, uh, other forms of art. Uh, we had mercantile trade that could happen because now we had more of one thing and less of another, so we found someone to trade it with based on supply and demand, which led to modern business. Uh, we had a, the rise of a noble class, people who owned the land who could charge tithes for it, and they could actually give us nobility, and, and in to some extent, the people who had power were the landowners rather than the armies. And agriculture is actually undergoing a second discontinuity today because Farming automation is incredibly uh, different from what farming is in our heads and in the school books that we perceive. 70% uh, of North Americans were farming 100 years ago, now less than 1% farms. That's a massive change, right? From 70% to less than 1%. And it's not just North America. That cliff is Asia. So farming is fundamentally different. In 1800, only 3% of people lived in what we would call an urban area. Today, 75% of people in a developed nation live in an urban area. It's hard to understand what that world would have been like. Mass production is another example of triggering a discontinuity. When Gutenberg created the printing press, it allowed us to create content at scale. 
And that was hard to see that this was going to trigger a discontinuity. But if you think about it, the printing press gave us democracy. Because the printing press gave us cheap books, which allowed us to write things on new topics, hand out cheaper leaflets, hammer things to doors like Martin Luther did, create literacy, and eventually you got democracy, right? So we have these triggers, these technological triggers, but the discontinuity is what happens to human understanding and human psychology afterwards. And we've seen the same kind of thing from the radio, which gave us the ability to broadcast a one-way message instantaneously to the entire population wartime addresses and things like that. The telescope, which helped us understand our space in the universe. The internet, which kind of gave us omniscience. Uh, the car, which changed how and where we live. It changed who we interact with. It actually even changed our genetic makeup. In England, you're never more than 70 miles from an ocean. And yet England, because they don't drive that much, you have accents from Yorkshire that are almost indistinguishable from, like they're almost unrecognizable as English. Sorry if you're from Yorkshire. My mom's from New York. It's pretty hard to understand. Whereas in America, you have a very similar, maybe there's some difference in the north and the south, but you have a very similar group of people because of the intermingling of those people by regions and so on. And it's not just technological change that triggers this kind of discontinuity. The understanding of natural selection and adaptation. Once we agreed that evolution was a thing, we were able to look at every creature and say what adaptation is a part of this creature's uh, body, why would the environment cause this genotype or this species to evolve this way? It changed our way of looking at nature. Uh, the heliocentric solar system and realizing that we're in the middle of the solar system changed it as well. Simply realizing the Earth is flat. Side note, there's a group of people that believe that it isn't. Uh, sorry, uh, that believe the Earth is flat. And those people, like, I don't know how you deny that the Earth could be round. You just get on a plane, but they're now claiming persecution. So this, these, these discontinuities don't, don't hit everyone at the same time. But just the concept that the Earth was round was a pretty big deal. Uh, the, our place in the universe, the Big Bang. So we have these changes in understanding. If you're, if you're a fan of civilization, this kind of feels like you're moving through the Civ tech tree, and now things are new and possible. And each of these leads to a difference in the way that humans think about their role in the universe and how society functions. Let me give you a slightly more recent example. If you grew up here in Quebec about 40 years ago, you might have listened to this weird show called Les Centours de Centours. Strange old guy with like a strange bracelet show. I, I just moved here. I'm like, what the hell is this? But you know, 40 years ago, The Beachcombers was on TV, right? Bruno Juicy was scooting up and down Vancouver. Um, obviously, I'm talking to a younger audience than myself. But at this time, you couldn't choose what to listen to in the car. Like the cassette tape was just coming out. That was pretty cool. Uh, the answering machine kind of hadn't happened yet. You had to like answer the phone or you missed the call, which is kind of weird. Um, if you wanted to get somewhere, you went and bought a Thomas guide. This one's more recent, but you bought a book and you looked up the address. And then I, I guess they didn't pull you over for like holding a map, but I, I, it's beyond me how people figured out where they were going. Uh, you told your kids, be back in time for dinner. And that was it. You didn't know where they were. They just had to be back in time for dinner. You can't like helicopter parent them or put some kind of app on their phone or get them to text you where they are. And when they came back for dinner, let's not forget crown roast of Frankfurters, milk chicken, and cup steak puddings, the delicious foods of the 70s. Um, if you wanted to know where your friends are at, you had to like phone them and hope they were near a thing that rang with a mechanical dial. Uh, your status updates were like, if there's something in your mailbox. This seems kind of weird, but like the smartphone came along and it consumed all of our household electronics and gave us a prosthetic phone. And it's very hard to imagine life without your cell phone today. So your cell phone is a discontinuity. It's a moment before which it's very hard to understand life. It's hard, people often say, you know, I don't know what life was like before that. Uh, worldwide cell phone sales have gone up dramatically. It used to be thought of as a niche product for Gordon Gecko to use on the beach, and now it's something that teens use to text one another in a mall. We look at our phones 47 times a day. If you're younger, it's about 82 times a day, and everybody believes these are understated, but no one will admit to it. 30% uh, of us check it in the five minutes before we go to sleep. Half of us wake up in the night and check our phones, and within five minutes of waking up, we have checked our social networks, our email, or our text messaging. We are addicted to and defined by these things. In a minute of me speaking, 320,000 Canadian person minutes have passed on Facebook. Every minute, Canadians spend 320,000 minutes on Facebook. Uh, it has been estimated it's cost America, the United States, 3.5 trillion in lost productivity. That's just Facebook. 
So when you say, I can't imagine my world before a smartphone, that's a discontinuity. And this fundamentally is what I th think is interesting because what we're seeing here is the advent of digital arriving in every industry in the world. And for every industry digital enters, it destroys. If you look at the lifespan of a Fortune 500 company or an S&P 500 company, they have dropped dramatically. This chart shows you that a Standard & Poor 500 country in the, a company in the 1950s had a life expectancy of around 65 years. That company today might last 15 years, one five. You've probably all seen this chart as well. Back 15 years ago, most of the big companies were not digital companies. Microsoft was a software licensing company, basically. Today, five of the five biggest companies are digital-first organizations. <coughs> and sadly, if your CEO says, you know what, we'll just innovate, that's fine. It's unlikely you'll succeed because in the Fortune 500, let's say that your life expectancy has dropped from 75 to 15 years. There's a 95% chance that you will actually be able to innovate your way into a new product. Sorry, there's a 95% chance you'll fail trying to innovate your way into a new product or service. Clay Christensen says it's a 99% chance. So you're going to die and there's no cure, is the message from digital. So far, the only industries that have really been disrupted, like completely overhauled, are media and retail. Uh, if you think about media, remember, Facebook is the world's biggest publisher by a long shot. Um, and as Jeff Jarvis says, advertising is actually like the last recourse of publishing. The fact that we pay for things by advertising, the fact that publishers hope to make ad revenue is already a sign of failure because it's the worst form of revenue if you're an advertiser. You'd like to have subscriptions or purchases or whatever. So we've already kind of capitulated. That's the only thing they can do. Content is so cheap that the only way we can pay for it is to throw pictures next to it and hope you notice them and click on them by accident. If you don't believe me, consider this video. This is a video of a kid, of a person opening eggs, like Kinder eggs. They're just taking little plastic eggs, opening them up, looking at what's inside, putting them aside over and over again. That's it, 10 minutes. This video has been viewed 652 million times. The only salvation I have for humanity is that we seem roughly split on whether it's good or bad. But it is effortless to create something that will be seen by hundreds of millions of people for free. That's transformative for media. And retail has also been completely overrun. Amazon is the titan here. It's basically Amazon versus the rest of the world. They're bigger than most large retailers combined. And most retail stores have shrunk as much as 96% in market value. Amazon's increased 1,934% 1, since 2006. It's very hard to see these changes ahead of time. You might say, why didn't we see this stuff coming, right? But we're awful at seeing the other side of a discontinuity. I used to read a lot of science fiction books. And I remember on the front of one, and I couldn't find the cover of it, was a bunch of passengers boarding an intergalactic spaceship, paying with paper tickets. And I just thought, you know, we missed the, the smartphone entirely that you would be paying with, or the retinal scan or whatever. Here they are in downtown New York taking photos with an SLR, but they traveled from another galaxy. Uh, even the Jetsons forgot about flat screens. I mean, they had, you know, household robots and flying cars, completely forgot the flat screen. We're terrible at predicting the future. So I'm going to give you an example of how bad we are. I'm going to talk about horseshit. This is Joseph Reynolds. He is the short-lived mayor of London, England. He only served for one year. It wasn't very good. Um, but he was the Lord Mayor at a time of huge crisis in London. It was a crisis of manure. Uh, at the time, in the late 1800s, the big cities of the world were almost literally drowning in manure. They had a huge problem. This is actually known in history as the Great Horse Manure Crisis of 1894. That's why it's the last talk of the day, because I'm literally talking about horse shit right now. Um, <laughs> There were 11,000 of these handsome carts in London at the time, thousands of horse-drawn carts, which had 12 horses per dray and so on. Um, 50,000 horses were transporting people every single day in London. That included all the other carts and stuff that were getting pulled. And the average horse, let's talk about poop, produces 15 to 35 pounds of manure a day, not to mention two pints of urine. So. Um, oh, yeah, also typhoid and other bad diseases that get spread. And when the horse dies, because a horse that's working hard dies up in about three years, we leave the carcass on the ground to congeal, then we carve it up. That's about 65 rotting carcasses a day. 
Also why my talk is not right after lunch. New York City had 100,000 horses. Uh, that meant 2.5 million pounds of horse manure a day on the island of Manhattan. The London Times said this was the biggest crisis humanity was facing. In 50 years, every street will be buried under nine feet of manure. They convened a convention called the 1898 World's Con uh, Planning Conference. The mayors of the cities showed up, they met for three days, and they left saying, we give up. <laughs> By 1912, there were no horses, we had cars everywhere. We're terrible at figuring out what the future's gonna look like from this side, because we can't envision how the world is gonna change. Let me give you a second example. Uh, this is another historical figure. His name is Donald McKinnon. He was the captain of a boat called the Taping. This is also in the 1800s. The British had developed an incredible love of tea. In fact, they were completely addicted to it. They found that tea would come from India and China. They'd have to get it to England. They loved it so much, they created a brutal monopoly called the British East India Company to get tea and opium and stuff, but mostly tea. Well, apparently mostly tea. So the British weren't very good at this because monopolies don't tend to be very innovative, and so they had these big, slow tea chips that would like bring the tea back and it wouldn't do very well. And so after a while, they said, you know what? We need to end the use of the monopoly because now there's enough competition. We're gonna open it up for free trade. And they did so, creating these ships. They're called clippers. They were very, very fast ships. And these things were fast for a reason. Because if you were fast, you could get very rich. You got to charge an extra pound per ton, so 177 pounds of today's money, per ton of tea you would bring back. So the fastest ship home, because it could charge more for being the first ship to arrive, got to charge a lot of money. And this kind of turned into a race. Like people started gambling on it. And it wasn't a simple thing of who could sail fastest, because if you pick the tea too soon, then it's bitter. And if you wait too long, then it's better and there's more of it, but you get home late. So you got a whole trade-off to deal with there. Um, when you get in and out of port, you got to work with the logistics and the tides and all this kind of stuff. Uh, more cargo means more money, but less cargo means you go faster. Loading these things was incredible. It took 200 tons of shingle on the bottom of the boat, and then they stacked layers and layers of tea and silk. The worse tea at the bottom, because it might get salty, the better tea at the top. Amazingly, they had 16 of these ships that would pull alongside the boat at the same time, and they would load it. In fact, it took them only 17 hours to load 8,000 tea chests and 1,141 bales of silk. 17 hours. Everything about this process was optimized. So, on a fateful day in 1866, come with me if you will, four ships are ready to set sail on the same tide out of Hong Kong. The winner will make about $1.2 million US for being home first. And this is kind of a big deal because there used to be this thing called the shipping news that told us a little bit about how much money, uh, about how the boats were doing, what the weather was like, but this hit the mainstream. This wasn't in the shipping news, this was on the front page of newspapers. People would track this race it was going to sail 15,800 nautical miles. The British really liked their tea. So these boats start sailing. They want to get there fast, which means they had to sail close to the shore where the onshore breezes are. There's monsoons at this time. Uh, they're constantly readjusting their ballast as they drink water or they eat supplies so they stay stable. Uh, if someone in Mauritius sees the boat across the horizon and sends a telegram to New York, it changes the betting odds in London. It's, it's a big deal. And this happens and they get to London within two hours of each other. Think about what that means. 15,800 nautical miles, right? Two, three ships left on the same time, one was held up. They sailed over 15,000 miles, over 100 days, and they arrived two hours apart. They had optimized every single thing about this. That was a problem. The first problem, of course, was that a three-way tie means less profit. In fact, 1866, with all this excitement, and I know you're excited now, was the last year that they, did, that they had a prize for this. That was it, they were done, no more prizes. Three boats arrived, same time, no one gets to charge more for their tea, all the profit goes out of the market. You've over-optimized the current model. But the real problem is, because this is the model everybody's addicted to, the real problem was there's a book called The Earl King that had arrived two weeks before, because it was a steamer. And they'd gotten from London, they left Hong Kong later with better tea, better grown, they take in as fast, and the second problem is they're building a Suez Canal, which you can't sail down. So we are terrible at anticipating these changes, whether it's automation, whether it's the arrival of steam. <clears throat> Let me give you a slightly more recent example, because we spent some time in the 1800s, of Netflix and Blockbuster. 
Netflix, uh, sorry, Blockbuster, as you probably know, is a now defunct store. We used to be able to rent these things called videotapes. Trust me, they existed. They were these big bricks that you put into something and they wound a spool of mad. It was videotapes. They're not very interesting. But Blockbuster was bankrupt. Why was Blockbuster bankrupt? Because Blockbuster had everything going for it. Blockbuster should, by all rights, be Netflix today. And what I mean by, by all rights is not only did they have tremendous inventory, sorry about that, they had tremendous inventory, but they also had um, an amazing amount of information about their customers. And that information about their customers included uh, market intelligence about what you'd bought in the, la in the past. Sorry, it sounds a little loud, but better. Market intelligence about what they had, in the, what they'd rented in the past. Your credit card information from which I could source like what your history was. I could charge you for things. I knew where you lived. I knew everything about you. The data I had was incredible. But the problem was that Blockbuster didn't see itself in the entertainment delivery business. Blockbuster thought it was in the video store rental management business. When Blockbuster went bankrupt, its biggest sources of revenue were in-store concession sales and late fees. Just like the uh, clipper ship captain, they had optimized for the current world incredibly well. They knew exactly what late fee to charge you, so you were a little too tired to take the movie back, and you're like, ah, just one more day. Right? They knew exactly, like one penny less than the value you were willing to concede for not having to go out at night and take the movie back. And they spent tons of money and time researching this. Blockbuster, Netflix, on the other hand, realized it was in the entertainment delivery business, and they've actually learned this lesson well because now, if you think about it, now that video delivery is cheap and easy, Netflix is in the content creation business because they've realized that they're going to become out of date if they don't get into that business as well. But the second problem was waiting for the future because Blockbuster knew streaming was inevitable. In fact, Blockbuster had a live streaming offering, Blockbuster On Demand, before Netflix hit the market. But there was no sense of urgency with them. Blockbuster went out and asked analysts, how long until sustainable broadband that's able to stream video is going to be available in every house in North America, and how long will it spread to the point where it's profitable? The analysts came back with a prediction. Blockbuster went, ah, we have some time. No rush. We'll just skim off the top. It'll be a novelty for a while. Meanwhile, the guys at Netflix are like, ah, you know what? We really got to get to market soon. Reed Hastings said, I got to make this company work. I know it'll happen in the future. We're going to create our own broadband network. It turns out if you put a DVD of 4.6 gigs into the envelope in the post and you mail it to someone, it takes 48 hours. That's a 228 kilobit per second uh, broadband network with a really high latency on the first packet. But it works. They didn't call it Postal Flix. They called it Netflix. This was a way of making the future happen sooner. Netflix was actually so eager to get to streaming that the DVD business was doing really well. They had great collection, great catalog, and Reed actually said, you're no longer allowed to come to management meetings, DVD division. Like, he told them they couldn't come. He intentionally had to kill them. He had to burn the boats. They were so eager to get there. Um, Elon Musk is another example of someone who did this. You may not know this, but Elon decided to create an electric car when he saw General Motors recalling and crushing all their electric cars. GM was clearly unaware of it. I think today GM would love to be Elon Musk. And Elon Musk didn't want to wait for the self-driving car because he realized electric cars are no longer a sustainable competitive advantage because other people are doing it. So he got up one night and pushed self-driving to all his cars. Can you imagine being a regulator in Washington, D.C., and you wake up one day and they go, oh, it turns out Elon upgraded all his cars. They're self-driving now. And you're like, I thought I had six years to come up with laws on this. He just pushed a software update. That's weird, right? Just like Netflix is already reinventing itself, moving from entertainment delivery to entertainment creation, Tesla is already re reinventing itself, moving from electric cars to self-driving cars. The attacker always wants the future to happen faster. But that's really hard to do. All these are examples of how stupid as humans we are when trying to guess the future, whether it's horseshit or tea or video streaming or electric cars, we're really, really bad at predicting the future because those things are discontinuities. It's really hard to see them from the other side. So how should we think about that? Well, I usually think about it in terms of um, supply and demand and abundance and scarcity. Generally speaking, I like to look at what are the unintended consequences that will happen if something becomes abundant. I like to look at when something becomes abundant, what does it consume, what will become scarce, and I like to look at what happens when supply creates demand. So for the first of these, I want to introduce you to Edward Tenor. 
He's the author of a book called Why Things Bite Back, The Unintended Consequences of Technology, and he has an almost perverse love of finding cases where we thought something was going to happen, but it had an unintended consequence. For example, football helmets led to a rise in injuries among football players. The intent of football helmets was to protect players, but when you give a brave young man who's a little bit thick a metal cap, he decides to use it as a weapon, gameplay changes, and now you have a rise in head injuries. Because that guy puts it on, he just wants to use brute force and bonk into people, and all of a sudden you have problems with concussions in the sport. Doesn't happen the same way in rugby. Um, another example Tenor likes to cite is the personal computer. The personal computer was supposed to usher in the paperless office. None of us would ever have to use paper again. We use more paper in offices today than we ever have before, and the main reason is that it turned everyone into a desktop publisher, where before actually getting something printed was a lot of work at a mimeograph or a secretary or whatever. Today everyone's a desktop publisher, so we consume a lot more pa um, paper because we can print things by ourselves. And one of my favorite examples that I heard recently, this is one of tenors, is that uh, putting airplane seats into airplanes for children, like forcing a parent to buy a seat for their child and put a plane seat in it, would cause more accidents. In fact, they nipped this one in the bud. The FAA was going to make it a requirement that parents bought seats for children, and then you'd have to put a car seat in that seat and buckle the child in, which sounds great, except that when you actually look at what happens, the increased price of traveling means a parent will use a car for shorter trips instead of taking the airplane, and there is a far higher chance of a fatality in a car than on an airplane, so it would actually result in more deaths. So one of my favorite things to do is to look at an industry, look at innovation, say, what's the perverse consequence of this thing? If you have AI that's making perfect copies of everything, maybe the imperfect becomes more desirable. Um, so I love to look at the unintended consequences of the innovation. It's the first thing I do. The second one, um, sorry, that's, so that's my first way to predict it, is unintended consequences. The second one I want to talk about a guy named Herbert Simon. Simon is an economist. Uh, he's famous for talking about the attention economy, and he said, that what matters is what's scarce, because we fight over what's scarce. So when something becomes abundant, ask yourself what it consumes. He said we live in an attention economy because information is abundant and information consumes our attention, so we live in an attention economy. And basically that means that attention becomes precious. Facebook is valued where it is because it has our attention for 60 minutes a day. So if you look at something that technology will make abundant, what will then become scarce? What will that thing consume? And that's a very good question to ask yourself when you're trying to predict the future, so that's my second way of predicting. And then my third way of predicting the future is another historical figure, William Stanley Jevons. Uh, Jevons is a fascinating guy. At the dawn of the industrial era, the British had an incredible amount of coal that they needed to use to run the steam engines and the boats and those steamers that were going to destroy the tea clippers and so on. And so he wrote a treatise called The Coal Question. And he was basically told, hey, how much coal do we have? How long is it going to last? And around that time, there was this thing called Newcomen's Atmospheric Engine, which was the state-of-the-art engine that they put coal into and they pumped, uh, made steam from and created power. And so he was looking at how much coal there was and how efficient this was when something came along. James Watt built a steam engine that was four times as efficient, consumed 25% of the energy for the same amount of power. This thing's pretty awesome, right? I mean, it's massive and it uses 75% less coal. So if you're Jevons, like, huh, that's a really good thing except consumption was accelerating. Even though we got four times more efficient, consumption went up, which led him to ask some difficult questions at the time. And as a result of that question, he came up with a conclusion. Because he said, shouldn't more efficiency lead to less consumption? Shouldn't that be how it works? But it turns out that's not how it works, because efficiency means lower costs. Lower costs means new uses. New uses means more demand, and more demand means more consumption. This is known as Jevons' paradox. It can be summarized as sometimes supply creates more demand. And I think this is super important, because in tech, we used to have tech that was incredibly precious, and now it's cheap. Put another way, your mobile phone has more computing power than all of NASA. They landed men on the, Mar on the moon, we launch a bird into pigs. Uh, the Technology we have, we take for granted, it's so cheap, it's so abundant, we find these new uses for it. So the third way to predict it is to say, how will new abundance create new demand? Uh, this has happened uh, with things like the VCR. Jack Valenti said, how dare you have VCRs in the home? In fact, he said the VCR is akin to the Boston Strangler to the woman home alone. 
which may have been an overstatement, and yet the recording industry, movie industry, made more money than ever after the introduction of VCR because of home screenings. So in many cases, we look at a technology, it's going to be horrible, it creates more abundance. And this matters to founders because discontinuities reveal new markets and new uses. Anybody who has ever pitched a VC, and any VC who's in the room, has asked this question. Hey, you're in a market. I want to know how big it's going to be. It's going to go rapidly. How big is the total addressable market? They care about this. Every investor wants to know the size of the market, right? It's a really annoying question. What they should be asking is this. Do you have a technology that when it grows rapidly will cause abundance to happen, creating new demand that leads to a discontinuity? This is what breakout startups look like. It's not about total addressable market. It's about the technology's ability, when married to human behavior, to trigger a discontinuity. This is the future of all technologies. So ask yourself, what discontinuities might be created? I'm going to wrap up by picking a few here. Artificial intelligence is a pretty good one. So when artificial intelligence comes along, what's that going to do? Well, it's pretty clear that AI is in unbelievably efficient. This is AI playing Pong. In its first hour, it was stupid. In its second hour, it didn't miss. In its third hour, it found an Easter egg in the game that the developers hadn't noticed and beat the highest score of any humor ever. That's three hours. AI is unreasonably good at anything. So what is AI going to do? Well, you may remember a few months ago, United dragged someone off an airplane. And everyone was alarmed about the video. I was alarmed about something else. I was alarmed about the words, um, this part here. Uh, it said a computer would select who would be taken off the plane. So I'm worried about what happens in a world where AI, we abdicate decisions to it, like Milgram's 37 style. We say, it's not me, it's the machine. The algorithm said so. If you've watched Little Britain, it's the computer says no. And so um, we are going to see when, when AI consumes um, compassion, we're going to see a rise of compassion. We're going to see humans who become advocates for the gray areas of society, who become like your human advocate against the algorithm. You find a single mom who's just above the welfare line, but she has three kids with learning disabilities. How does that person get an exception? We're going to see the rise of humans as agents of compassion. I met with the head of privacy for the EU a few years ago, and he said to me, Alistair, do you know why the French, French from France, hate traffic cameras? I said, why? He said, well, um, we can overlook a little infidelity, smell of cologne, lipstick on the collar, but when you get a photo that's sent to you of your spouse in a car with someone else, that's, you can't ignore that. So the French actually reversed the law and said, we won't send you a photo unless you contest the ticket, which apparently has the unintended consequence of lots of spouses going, go ahead, contest it, I dare you, go ahead. But life lives in these gray areas, right? And we are going to need more of those gray areas. Um, a second thing about AI is going to be governance. When Volkswagen had an algorithm that could cheat the regulators by altering its behavior under testing, we needed to get in and crack the black box open. In Nevada, if you have a gaming system, the Nevada Gaming Commission has the right to go in and run a bunch of tests and look at the code to see if the algorithms are just and fair and legal. Um, it, we will see the emergence of knowledge we can't explain. Multi-dimensional patterns. I don't know why the machine recommended this, but it did. That's weird, because it's kind of like the end of science. Like, I'm willing to abandon causality. So how do we learn to explain what a machine has concluded? Second example of unintended consequences. So um, bots, you may have heard a lot about. A bot is a script or an interface that automates things. This is a guy named Casey. I'm going to read you Casey's Tinder profile, because I'm really awkward. Um, my perfect date night, I pick you up in my Ford Focus. You get in, there's candles in the car. You go, isn't that dangerous? And I go, yes, but I like danger. We go to your favorite restaurant, have a fantastic meal. We come outside, and you see my car's on fire. You go, Casey, your car's on fire. Aren't you upset? I pull out a bag of marshmallows and go, no, I knew this was going to happen. And then I kiss you in front of my burning car. First of all, Casey sounds like a great date. But this, this has actually been A-B tested very carefully, because Casey's actually a data scientist. So even things like saying yours car makes it look like he makes typos, he doesn't take things too seriously. Everything has been optimized. But he didn't stop there, because Casey uses a piece of software called Eigenfaces, which he has trained to recognize the faces of women he considers attractive. And it swipes left and right for Casey. And if you are lucky enough to pass the gauntlet of Casey's face test, you get to talk to a chatbot. And if you answer questions correctly, you too could have a date with Casey. 
Um, Casey reported that all the women that he did this with were uh, totally cool with it, found it very interesting. I think he may have a selection bias. <laughs> there's, a, there's reasons why that data came out the way it did. But it's a fascinating story. He wrote this all up, maybe not a good idea, but I think the future is gonna be like my bot talks to your bot and tries to find a date, so maybe what becomes abundant is actual human contact. Fancy that, right? Anytime we see one of these scarcities, we say what's the unintended consequences. For robotics, robotics is crazy. The Changing Precision Technology Company replaced 90% of its workers with robots. They saw 162.5% increase. They went from 8,000 to 21,000 pieces a day. And at the end of that, the products were five times better, lower defect quality. We should welcome our industrial robots. In fact, in 2016, there's just 1.7 million of these things. But by 2025, there will be about 5 million industrial robots on the planet. Many of them work in automotive, but increasingly in other industries. Every robot replaces 5.6 humans. We lose 1.3% employment and our wages go down by 1.9% if those robots fit the prediction of 5 million by 2025 that we expect. And the robot really doesn't care what color your collar is. In fact, increasingly government and banking jobs and finance jobs and lawyer jobs are the ones that are most at risk. Uh, it's not just automation, it's not just blue collar jobs. Um, Panera Bread now has touch screens, you can order things, this is McDonald's doing it. And this is a robotic hamburger flipper called Flippy that makes hamburger patties automatically, probably more cleanly, more sterile, doesn't get sick, et cetera. Obviously, the first thing that becomes scarce when robotics is everywhere is jobs. And that's an interesting thought. Someone asked me, what do you think the future is going to be like? I said, well, in a world where we have um, an abundance of automation, today, the poor have to work, the working poor, and the rich get to be rich, the idle rich, they don't have to work. In the future, it's going to be like, the poor are idle and the rich have jobs. Wow, you have a job? That's, what do you do? Why, you, you, you're not on basic income? What do you do? You must be important. That's like a societal reversal, right? But other stuff, uh, unions are gonna hate this. Uh, being busy is gonna be a real problem. How do you occupy your time? Let's go through a couple more quickly. Mike already talked a little about automated transportation. Uh, the car in the UK is parked during the daytime 93.6% of the time. Uh, we're going to see an end to car ownership. Owning a personal sedan over the next 20 years will cost 87 cents. Automated mobility services you subscribe to will cost 35 cents. This stunned me. In 1998, 64% of people eligible to drive had a driver's license. In 4, 000, uh, 2008, only 46% of those people had a driver's license, something nobody seems to be paying attention to. Trucking is 81% of freight revenue. Seven million people are employed by trucking. That means that one out of every 50 Americans drives a truck for a living. There are 1,230 truck plazas in America, 51,000 taxi drivers in New York City alone, 13,000 taxi licenses valued at over 500,000 a license. So obviously jobs get lost because of that, but there's other weird stuff. We change how urban areas are designed. We'll have cars that can park themselves. We'll have service stations that are farther out of town. We no longer need centralized gas stations and so on. Some weird ones, like police forces make an average, make, sorry, every year make $6.2 billion from ticket revenue, like speeding. When cars tow the line and do what they're told, the, rev the main source of revenue for many small drive-through cities in America goes away, and they gotta replace that shortfall. And new work habits will happen. If I had a meeting in Boston and I was able to call up a self-driving car, I'd just get in the car. Like, what does that do to Bombardier aerospace short-haul jet programs? So there's some really weird consequences here. E-commerce, um, one of the big things is the death of the mall, but that means we might see the mall come back as a hospital, a resort property, a city hall, a data center, a daycare. These are all examples of things malls in the US are being repurposed into. Um, we may also see a world where everything is a subscription. You no longer have savings. You start talking about your monthly burn rate and what services you subscribe to. Genetic screening. A technology like genetics is going to have a bunch of other really weird consequences. For example, if we live longer, that's great. But it turns out, this is a weird thing. We tax smoking and drinking because they increase the healthcare cost, right? That's not true. A smoker actually costs us less because they die sooner. So um, it turns out that uh, abundant diagnostics may cause scarce treatments. If we have really good medical technology, which gives us cheaper healthcare, which gives us more diagnoses automatically, a camera that can detect a legion or whatever, we get more treatment, treatment, which may lead to costlier healthcare. There's something called comorbidity. When someone dies, they usually have two or three diseases. If you treat all two or three, that's really expensive. You just want to treat the one that's going to kill them. <coughs> Excuse me. 
Um, and of course, will we be allowed to have unenhanced children? There's some really interesting, chewy, moral issues. Maybe it would be more desirable to have a natural baby the way today people want like a cleanse or they don't believe in vaccination. So who knows what the consequences will be? A couple more quick ones. Cultivated meat. This stat astonished me. Um, the cost of a burger grown in a vat was $325,000 in 2013. In 2016, that's $11.36. How many people here would pay $11.36 for a burger today? Okay, what about $6 for a burger? What if you went to a restaurant and for $15 you could have a burger that was cruelty-free and grown in a vat and sterile and had no parasites? Seems pretty reasonable, right? So um, you may have seen this diagram. We've basically colonized Earth and put the mammals to our use. Uh, this is an XKCD diagram. The humans are the gray dots in the middle. Cattle is all this stuff over on the left. There's pigs, goats, sheep, horses. The little green dots are what we think of as animals. The little tiny green dots, right? What happens to the earth when we start growing everything in vats for a whole bunch of reasons? Because we got cheaper energy, because it's safer, more sustainable. What happens to that world? Because energy is going to get cheaper too. In fact, in April was the first time ever that California had a net wholesale loss where they were actually getting negative wholesale electricity prices because so many people were putting energy back on the grid in California. Well, one of the consequences of that is fresh water because now we can desalinate things cheaply and efficiently, which makes certain coasts that are, that are um, incredibly drought ridden all of a sudden successful arable land. And as Trina mentioned yesterday, you can do vertical indoor farming with eight times the crop yield in a warehouse in downtown Brooklyn if you have cheap energy. So um, this means that things like food might join education and healthcare as basic rights, at least here in Canada. Now, if you put all that together, you live in a really weird world, right? Maybe we're all living in malls. We subscribe to services, including driving cars. And that mall includes some kind of efficient energy to grow the food and treat the water locally in our mall, which has parking and the parking lots are covered in solar and photovoltaic and stuff like that. That's an entirely doable view. But you don't think about like living in mall colonies as a logical consequence. What happens is when you look at a bunch of technologies, you stitch them together, then you can start to have these conversations about what the future might look like. So to recap, we miss stuff because we are terrible at noticing big changes. They sneak up on us, we frame the current problem, and we don't have obvious innovations. I didn't talk about the perfume thing. Um, and then we should think about it by saying, hey, what are the unintended consequences? When something becomes abundant, what does it consume? What becomes scarce? And what happens when supply creates demand? Because looking at the future of an individual technology is easy. They're going to add another lens to the iPhone. They're going to add VR features, whatever. But trying to understand what a discontinuity might be triggered by a particular stack of technologies is how you will understand the future of the future. I went a little over, but hopefully you all stayed and it was fun. If you have any questions, that's me. And. One last thought, I know that was kind of a, like a race through a bunch of stuff. Um, one last thought, if you um, see any of the speakers out there today that are still here, please thank them. This is, e every year we don't know how we're going to get better and the caliber of content I've been watching here has been fantastic. You guys have been an amazing audience sticking with us in these hot tents and rainy conditions. Um, thank you all for being part of this festival. It is the highlight of all of our years and um, we love you dearly. Go out there, have a beer, say hi. Enjoy the rest of the day. Thank you all very much for coming to Startup Fest. <laughs>